Yeah. Hello and how are you? Hey friends, welcome to the Shen Show. I am your host, Shenandoah Briscoe, coming to you from right here in St. Charles, Missouri. Established back in 1806. Anyway, uh, let's see. Today is Tuesday, July 31st, 2018. B-Blog number 2,349. Just got back from the VA hospital today, just doing a few checkups to make sure that I'm still alive and still a human being. Anyway, got some happy birthday shout-outs going out to uh, Beverly Jones and Douglas Ferguson. I already threw them out the other day because, well, they all got conglomerated under one date, and, well, wasn't quite fair. So, I got happy birthday uh, shout-outs to Doug and Beverly, and so here we go with their birthday songs. Hey, I heard it's your birthday today, so happy birthday, I must say. You know, Beverly and Doug, there's a one more year gone away, so happy birthday to you today. I said, hey, I heard it's your birthday today, so happy birthday, I must say. You know, there's one more year gone away, so happy birthday to you today. Then I got a happy friend anniversary shout out going out to uh, Chris Edinburgh. So for our five year uh, friend anniversary, I'm gonna say happy friend anniversary to you. All right, all right. Now then, um, I used uh, that'd be happy friend anniversary to you, uh, Chris. Anyway. Five years, boy, boy, boy. We've been friends for a long time. Well, at least on Facebook. Maybe even longer in life. Not going to swear to it. For sure, for sure, for sure. Anyway, you know, I usually like to talk a little bit about St. Charles, Missouri. And, well, I think I'll put my uh, uh, information towards the uh, Lewis and Clark expedition. Because it did actually start in St. Charles, Prior to that, it was the Corps of Engineer. I mean, the Corps of Discovery, which started at the uh, Camp Du Bois, um, Du Bois, on the uh, Wood River at the confluence of the Mississippi River, uh, north of St. Louis. Uh, so we'll talk about that today. So let's see here. Now. While at the camp, it was Clark's responsibility to train the many different men who had volunteered to go on the Pacific, to go on to the Pacific on the expedition and turn them into efficient team. By the large most of the members of the Corps of Discovery were strangers to one another. The youngest man, George Shannon, was 17 years old, and the oldest, John Shields, was 35. The average age of the men was 27, and Clark had men build a fort and cabins out of logs, and he drilled them, teaching them how to march in formation, use their weapons as a team, and shoot efficiently at targets. Most of all, he tried to get the men to respect military authority and learn how to follow orders. When they would later force dangers on the frontier, there would be no time for any of the men to question the officers. Now, during the winter, Meriwether Lewis spent a lot of time in a little town of St. Louis. Now, Lewis had to gather more supplies and equipment for his journey because, well, there were more so many more volunteers that they were over twice as many men set out to go on the expedition as he had originally planned for. Lewis also talked with the fur traders who had been up the, uh, up the Missouri River and obtained maps made by earlier explorers. On March 9, 1804, Meriwether Lewis attended a special ceremony in St. Louis during which the Upper Louisiana Territory was transferred from to the United States. Now, two months later, on May 14th, the expedition was ready to begin. William Clark, Meriwether Lewis, oh, William Clark, 
and the Corps of Discovery left Camp River Du Bois and were joined by Meriwether Lewis in St. Charles, meaning that they were not Lewis and Clark expedition until they reached St. Charles. A week later, the party uh, numbered more than 45, mostly young unmarried soldiers. The civilians who made the journey were primarily the guides and interpreters. Among the more well-known were Sacagawea and her husband, Toussaint Charbonneau. Charbon. Their newest son, Jean Baptist Charbon, Little Pompey, while William Clark's black slave York and an interpreter named George Durillard pronounced Dwyer, Dwyer and additional group of men engaged in Inges, men of Inges, hired boatsmen, would travel only to the uh, mundane country for the first winter, and, then, and this included six soldiers and several French boatsmen. The travel up the Missouri River in 1804 was difficult and exhausting due to heat, injuries, and insects, as well as the troublesome river itself, with its strong current and many snags. The expedition used Lewis's 55-foot long keelboat and two smaller boats called Pirgois to carry their supplies and equipment. The boats used sails to move along. But in going upriver against a strong current, oars and long poles were used to push the boat. Sometimes the boats had to be pulled upriver with ropes by men walking along the shoreline. They averaged 10 to 15 miles per day. Although there were some initial discrepancies, disciplinary problems, the men began to work together as a team. And to like one another. One man they especially liked was Charles Floyd, one of the three sergeants. Suddenly, on August 20th, 1804, Sergeant Floyd got sick and died. It is believed that he had died of a burst appendix. Floyd was laid to rest on top of a large hill by the river in modern-day Sioux City, Iowa, where today there is a large monument to mark the spot. Sergeant Floyd was the only person to die out of the two and a half year journey, even though great dangers laid ahead. By October, the Corps of Discovery reached the villages of the Mandane Indians tribe, where they built Fort Mandane near present-day Stanton, North Dakota, and spent the winter of 1804 through 1805. The Mandarin people lived in earth lodges along the Missouri River. Their neighbors, the Hedits, lived along the Knife River, close by the village of the Mandane. The Hedits Hittites people were the center of a huge trade network in the West. Lewis and Clark were not the first explorer of European Americans to visit this part of the country. During the winter, Lewis and Clark recruited a Frenchman who had lived with the Hyundai since sometimes referred to as the Min Minotauri. Indians for many years. His name was Toussaint Charbonne. Charbonneau. Charbonneau. That's French, you know. And the captain, captains wanted him to act as an interpreter. They got a real bargain because along with Charbonne, who would come his 16-year-old 
Shoshone Indian wife, Shoshone Indian wife, Sacagawea, and her newborn baby boy. Sacagawea had been captured by a raiding party of Hethites warriors five years earlier, and was taken from their from her homeland in the Rocky Mountains to the Knife River Village, where she met her husband, Lewis and Clark, and knew that they would need, probably meet Sacagawea's people in the Rocky Mountains, and that they might have to ask for horses if they could not find a nearby stream which led down to the Columbia River. So, Sacagawea would be invaluable because she could speak to the, her people directly for the explorers. Let me see how much time we got going on here. Oh yeah, we got plenty of time. So, on August 7th, 1805, Lewis and Clark set, sent the keel boats back to St. Louis with an extensive collection of zoological, botanical, and ethnological specimens, as well as letters, reports, dispatches, and maps. Members of the expedition who had caused problems were sent back as well. As the keelboards headed south, the expedition, now numbering 33, resumed their journey westward in the two paragoys and six dugout canoes. The Corps of Discovery now traveled into regions which had been explored and seen only by American Indians. The men pulled and sailed their way their boats up the Missouri River through what is now Montana. By early June, they reached a place where two rivers met, and Lewis and Clark knew that they had to find the correct fork of the river. If they did not, they might not get to the Pacific Ocean in time for the winter, and the only clue they had was that the Indians had told them that the Missouri had a huge waterfall on it. They led small groups of soldiers up each river, and Lewis got up the right, Lewis going up the right fork, and Clark up the left, both looking for the waterfall. When they returned, both Lewis and Clark had decided that the left fork was the correct fork, was the correct river, even though neither party saw a waterfall. Although the rest of the party dis disagreed, they followed the two captains up the left fork, calling it the Missouri, and naming the right fork the Maris River, after a cousin of Meriwether Lewis. Sacagawea fell very sick, and the expedition moved slowly again against it, the strong currents of the river. Lewis became impatient and led a small party of men overland to see if the, he could find the waterfall. Otherwise, they would have to turn back and follow the other fork of the river. On June 13th, he spotted a mist rising above the hills of, in front of him. After a few minutes of walking, Lewis looked down into a deep ravine and saw a beautiful, huge waterfall. He knew they were on the right river. Lewis scouted ahead and found that there was not just one waterfall, but five, and that they stretched for many miles along the river and an area now known as Great Falls. The canoes could not be paddled upstream against such currents, and they would have to be portaged taken out of the water and carried uh, around these waterfalls. Sacagawea was well again after drinking water from a mineral spring. The Pyrgois were left behind by this point, so Lewis tried to put his special collapsible iron framed boat from Harper's Ferry together. 
He was very disappointed when the boat did not work, but Clark was ready to help by having two more dugout canoes made. They set out westward once more, paddling upstream, and soon they entered the Rocky Mountains and saw incredibly beautiful scenery with tall evergreen trees, and by August 17th, they reached the Three Forks of the Missouri, which marked the navig navigable limits navigable limits of the river. At this spot, the Missouri was fed by three rivers, which they named the Jefferson, the Gallatin, and the Madison, after government officials in Washington. They turned up the river named for President Jefferson, and finally reached its headwaters, where the one once mighty Missouri could be easily straddled by a man. And now that they had reached the crest of the Rocky Mountains, it was hoped that the headwaters of the Columbia would be nearby, and that the men could float and paddle their way downstream to the Pacific Ocean. However, they found nothing but more mountains stretching off as far as they could see. And Lewis knew then, as he crossed the Continental Divide through Lemus Pass, that there was no easy water route to the West Coast. This mountainous area was the homeland of Sacagawea's people. The shore Shishon, the, the Shishon. Now Lewis was need who needed horses to get his expedition over the mountains was finally able to contact the elusive Shoshone who had never seen a white man before. And when Shakajuia Sakajuia came along the trail with her baby son on her back she suddenly recognized the chief of the Shoshone, and the man for whom she was supposed to interpret, and he was her brother. Although she got to see old friends and her family, Sacagawea did not decide to stay with the Shoshone. She continued with Lewis and Clark, her husband and baby, as the captains looked westward and hoped to find a way to the Pacific Ocean before the harsh winter weather had set in. The explorers traveled overland on horseback north to Lola Pass, where they crossed the Bitterroot Range and the Lola Trail. This was the most difficult part of the journey. The men most almost starved on the trail, and were lucky to stumble into the camp of the Nez Perez Indians, and they treated the explorers with kindness, feeding and helping them, pointing the way to the Pacific. Lewis and Clark left their horses for safekeeping with the honest Nez Perez and finished making dugout canoes, and they floated down the Clearwater, Snake, and Columbia Rivers, portaging dangerous waterfalls and trading with friendly Indians along the way. They researched, they reached the Pacific Ocean by mid-November 1805. They had fulfilled the goal for, set for them by President Jefferson, and now they had to make it through another winter and return with their information. Once in sight of the ocean, the expedition was lashed by harsh winds and cold rain, and as they huddled together on the north side of the Columbia River, it was decided to stay on the south side of the river inland, where the winds and rain would be less harsh and there would be more elk to hunt for food and clothing. In December, the explorers built Fort 
class clats up near president present day Austria, Oregon, Astoria, Oregon, and settled in for the winter. Lewis and Clark accomplished and recorded information regarding the country and its inhabitants. The men spent most of the winter making clothing and moccasins out of elk hides and trying to hunt for food in an area which seemed to have very little game. No contact was made with any trading ships, and Lewis and Clark knew that all the men would have to return to the United States by an overland route. On March 23, 1806, the return trip began. After a tough journey up the Columbia River, against strong currents and many waterfalls, the party received their horses from their friends, the Nez Perez, and waited in the Indian village for the deep mountain snows to melt. It wasn't until June that they could get over the mountains and back to the Missouri River Basin. And after crossing the bitter routes, uh, Lewis and Clark decided to split their parties at Lolo, Lola Pass in order to add to the knowledge that they had gathered. They wanted to be certain that there was not any easier way to cross the continent to the Pacific and that it had not they had not missed an important potential route or pass. Confident of their survival, Lewis went north along the Mis along the Missouri River while Clark went south along the Yellowstone River. And they planned to rendezvous where the Yellowstone and the Missouri Rivers came together in western North Dakota. Clark took the larger group with him, including Sacagawea and her husband and son, and York Lewis to Oh, and York. Lewis took along the best hunters and outdoorsmen, including George Druid Lord and the Feld brothers. While on the Murris River in Montana, Lewis's small group had a fight with a party of Blackfoot Indian, Blackfeet Indians, and was forced to kill two of the men who tried to steal their guns and horses at a place known as Two Medicine fight site, and this was the only violent incident of the entire journey, and while out hunting one day, Lewis was accidentally shot by Kurzate, a nearsighted member of his own crew. The painful wound in Lewis's backside kept him from being able to sit down or continue his journal writing. And soon after this near disaster, the Corps of Discovery was reunited in North Dakota. They returned to Montana, uh, to the Maiden Village, Mandane Village, where they left Charboni, Sacagawea, and the baby behind. Clark promised to take care of the baby, who he nicknamed Pump, and three years later, Charboni and Sacagawea brought Pomp down to St. Louis, where William Clark saw to his schooling. The Lewis and Clark expedition returned to St. Louis September 23, 1806, when people in the settled portions of the United States heard that Lewis and Clark had returned from the West. They would barely believe it, and most people had given a them up for dead. If wild animals, hunger, harsh weather, or Indians hadn't killed them, perhaps they had gotten lost, and that they thought, of course, none of those things happened. Lewis Clark, Lewis Clark and nearly all their men returned to St. Louis as heroes. The Corps of Discovery abandoned in 
St. Louis disbanded in St. Louis and their detailed descriptions of the journey, maps, and numerous specimens that they had collected were sent to Philadelphia to be housed in part at the American Philosophical Society and later the Academy of National Science, Natural Science. Lewis and Clark made their way east past pausing for three weeks at Locust Grove, home of Clark's sister, and finally arriving in Washington, D.C., where they told President Jefferson all in person about the wonders that they had seen in the West. Both Lewis and Clark were rewarded for their success. Clark was appointed Indian agent at St. Louis after his marriage in 1808, and five years later he became governor of the Missouri Territory. In 1822, President Monroe appointed him superintendent of Indian affairs to establish and secure treaties with the western tribes. He died in St. Louis in 1838 and is buried in Bell Fountain Cemetery. Lewis was appointed to the governorship of the Louisiana Territory and challenging a challenging position in which he struggled to appease many divided fa factions factions and Lewis failed at many aspects of the governorship however most notably in the Pacific perception of how he spent official government funds Lewis was traveling to Washington DC in 1809 to explain his actions and clear his name when he died of two gunshot wounds one to his head and the other to his heart on October 11th. Most historians believe that Lewis committed suicide due to depression and problems in his life and career, while a popular belief continues that he was murdered perhaps by representatives of his own political en enemies. The explorer was buried not far from where he had died, and today a memorial, a memorial along the Naztec Trace Parkway pays tribute to the man who led the voyage of discoveries to the Pacific Ocean. For more information, please see The Journey and others who made the journey, from which this excerpt, excerpt on the Jefferson National Expansion Memorial's Lewis and Clark's Journey of Discovery. There you have it. Boy, I tell you what, that was a long one. Uh, let's go ahead and do the daily bread today. And uh, today's uh, devotion. Today's devotion of the daily bread is called Sinners Like Us. Yes. I will admit to that I am a sinner. Uh, I try each and every day not to sin, but there are just things that happen. Uh, you know, you see a very nice looking woman and you have to think in your head, wow, wouldn't I like to be married to her and what fun we would have. Well, that's a sin and so you have to keep your mind on the prize in the skies. Anyway, today I'm going to be reading Luke 15, 1 through 7. And if you're keeping up with your Bible in here, you should be reading Psalms 54 through 56 and Romans 3. Alright, here we go. Psalms 15, or uh, Luke 15, 1 through 7. The Parable of the Lost Sheep. Now the tax collector and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Both the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and lost one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country 
and go after the lost sheep until he finds it. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. So there you have it. All right, that looks like the end of it for me tonight, folks. So I'm going to say, well, goodbye, my friends. It's a time to go. I said goodbye, my friends. It's time to go. I hate to leave you, but I really must go. Goodbye, my friends. Goodbye. This here has been Shenandoah Briscoe saying hello and how are you. And thanks for tuning in to the Shen Show. And by all means, come back and see me tomorrow because, well, I'll be here. And I hope you are too. Love and God bless. We'll check you tomorrow.